Hello, everybody. I'm Robert Carver. And uh, I think it's traditional for these things to start by thanking the organisers for inviting you, so thank you. And um, also, I noticed on the website that apparently I'm the keynote speaker, which is a huge privilege uh, given the, the quality of the other presentations that you're going to see today, so thanks for that. Some of you who have been to these things before are probably thinking, well, there's something going wrong here because uh, the post-lunch slot at a conference is normally known as the graveyard slot because everyone's had a bit too much to eat and the coffee you've just drunk won't kick in for an hour or so. So most people are going to be sleeping through this. You're probably wondering why the keynote speaker has got the graveyard slot. I actually requested it um, because I couldn't get here for the first thing in the morning because um, you know, the, the lifestyle of a millionaire trader actually involves in practice. Your wife's saying to you, you're just an unemployed bum. You can take the kids to school. <laughs> so I had to do that before I came here, so that, that's why I couldn't make it first thing in the morning. So um, this is kind of an interesting setup, isn't it? We're sort of, I think we're two levels below ground. Um, I've never been at a conference two levels below ground before. I guess if there is a nuclear war, if the whole Trump-Kim thing doesn't work out, this is where we're spending our time. Um, I think Andreas, who's one of the later speakers today, he once told me that every family in Switzerland has to have a nuclear bunker under their house um, so this is what it's like being in Switzerland. Um, I think one of the things that someone once told me about Switzerland is that everything that is um, not forbidden is compulsory. So um, if you're wondering what my question is on my policy is on taking questions during this presentation, questions are not forbidden, so they are actually compulsory. So one way of staying awake is for people to actually be interactive and put their hands up and yell questions at me. Um, I will make one slight point, though, which is that the sorts of questions I will want to hear are what I'd describe as clarifying questions, questions like, I do not understand that. Um, the reason I'm saying that is that it's quite a long presentation, and um, I'm also doing a session later on, which is going to be a kind of free-form Q&A session. So if you want to ask like, more involved questions about how to do something, or if you violently disagree with me about what I'm saying, that's fine, we'll talk about that later, but during the presentation, let's keep it to I don't understand type of questions, and like I said, they are compulsory. Okay, so let's kick off. So there are one, two, three, three pages of legal crap, um, which I think is a record, and amazingly, there's actually another page of legal crap at the end of the presentation, so... Um, I mean, it's quite depressing, isn't it? I guess this is what MIFID II is bringing us to. Um, I'm glad I don't actually work in the hedge fund industry anymore. I have to spend hours explaining this properly. Uh, anyway, right. So, why are we here? Well, we're here because um, we believe that algorithmic trading systems make money. How do you make algorithmic trading systems? Well, it's very simple. You start off with some data, historic data and you put it into a magic box. The magic box fits, creates a strategy which will suit the data. Um, and I like to divide the strategy up into two parts. An algorithm, which if you like is a set of instructions, like a recipe. So like if you're gonna cook a chicken, your algorithm might be put a chicken in oven, remove chicken when cooked. As you can tell, I'm not a chef. Um, there may be more steps involved than that, I don't really know. Um, then you also have then the, separately the parameters of the algorithm, which for a chicken would be how long do you cook it for and what temperature, okay? So similarly for strategies, I think it's helpful to divide them up into a choice of an algorithm and the choice of the parameters that go into that. Okay, and I describe this model as data first, because you start off with your data and you end up with the training strategy at the bottom. Now, this is not the way that anyone else in the world designs anything, okay? It's stupid. So let's imagine for a moment that, I used to use General Motors as my example in this, but let's be up to date and call and say Tesla. Let's imagine that Tesla make and design cars the same way that we make trading strategies. So what would they do? They basically get their factory with all the, like, the different bits of car that you can possibly have, all the different permutations of car, wheels and wing mirrors and all different shapes, sizes, colors, designs, 
And those, if you like, are the choices you can make between different strategies, between different algorithms, and between different parameters. And then what they do is they get a, a, some robots to go in there and pull out random combinations um, of all of those things until they basically had, I don't know, a trillion possible designs of car. Some would have like one wheel, some would have three wheels, some would have 17 wheels, some would have like their wing mirrors sticking out the bottom of the car because they'd be put together in all possible permutations because that's what we do normally when we design trading strategies. And then they'd say, well, which is the best car? And to do that, they would subject the car to a, a single test, like, um, so in America, so it'd be like a quarter mile drag race. So they'd line up this trillion cars on a drag strip, so wave the flag, and probably most of the cars wouldn't even go anywhere because they didn't have engines, or the engines were put in the wrong way around. Um, and then you say, at the end of the, the drag, the, the car that accelerates the fastest gets the line first, that is the best car. That doesn't make any sense, but that is how we design training strategies. We look at vast numbers of permutations, many of which make no sense at all, and then we pick from the one we want based on a single very narrow criteria. So I'm going to talk to you about doing things a slightly different way. Okay. So what's going on in the black box? What's going on in the black box is fitting, okay? So fitting is kind of what we do when we design trading strategies this way. Um, and why is fitting not necessarily a good thing? How can fitting go wrong? Why do people talk about overfitting and curve fitting? So this is a, a graph from a, a classic book on uh, statistic, statistics. Um, and I don't have a pointer, but basically what's happening as we move across the x-axis this way um, is that we're fitting a model that's more complex. So in, you know, in the jargon, it's got more degrees of freedom. So there might be a wider choice of algorithms we're considering, or a wider number of parameters, or a wider space that those parameters can occupy. So we make our model more complex that we're fitting to the data. And the red line shows you that when we do that on an in-sample basis, so where the, the model is being fitted and tested in the same place, if you like, same part of data, the model just gets better and better. Okay, so the y-axis is just prediction error, so we want a low prediction error. Um, you might prefer to think of this as chart ratio or alpha or something, in which case you'd invert it and it would be going up instead of down. But here we've got prediction error falling, which is good. And basically at some point where the number of degrees of freedom is equal to the um, number of data points, we'll get to a point where the model completely explains the data and there is no prediction error. Um, now, the problem is, of course, is that we can't actually make money out of in-sample backtests. We need to run trading strategies with real money, um, which means we need to do that in the future. We can't run trading strategies in the past, clearly. Um, so we, we often kind of simulate this exercise of fitting in the past, testing in the future, by splitting our data into uh, a test data set and a, a training data set and a test data set. The training data set is where we fit the model and the test data set is where we evaluate it. Okay? These are common terms used in, in machine learning. Um, sometimes in, in trading they're usually called in sample, which is the, the training sample, and out of sample, which is the test sample. Now when we increase the complexity of our model um, in the test sample, in the out of sample, the complexity, first of all to note, is always higher than the red line, okay? Um, unless the test and the training sample are identical, you're always gonna get slightly worse performance in the test sample in expectation. Um, but the other thing to notice is that this thing goes down, but the gap between it and the red line is getting bigger and bigger. And that's happening because the model's getting more and more complex, which obviously explains the training sample really well, but it's doing a worse and worse job of, of you know, doing well in the test sample. It's getting more and more um, overfit, if you like. And at some point, the green line actually starts going up. And basically, what you want to do is fit a model that hits the bottom of this green line, because that's where you're doing the best in the test sample. It's where you've got the lowest prediction error in the test sample. Everyone okay with this? Question at the back. You're going to have to shout a lot louder because I can't hear. Uh, 
Um, so cross-validation really is, is just a different way of cutting up your training and your test sample. You're still faced with the same fundamental problem, I think. Maybe we can talk about that later if, if your question is more complex than it first appears. Okay, cool. Right. Yes. Okay, in very simple language, when we go through this process of creating trading strategies by fitting them to past data, um, we want to make our model a little bit complicated because if it's too simple, it won't do anything. Yeah. Um, but if we make it too complicated, it'll try and essentially assume that the future is going to be exactly like the past and it'll be overfitted or curve fitted. Make sense? Yeah, so the red line showing what happens in sample. So in sample, more complicated models always do better. Out of sample, they do better to up to a point, but then they start to do worse, okay? So the idea is to get the model that does the best out of sample. Um, and the main point to make is that most people completely under, overestimate, underestimate exactly where this point is, okay? So they, they put, make models that are far too complicated. So they're actually over here somewhere. Yeah, and the green line's been going up for ages and they're doing really badly. They think they're over here, but they're not. You normally need a much more simple model than you think. Because financial data are really noisy. No, no, because the, the going up, I know it's a really bad graph, isn't it? But going up is bad, not good. So if it helps to invert this in your head, you need to do that. Stand on your head. And <laughs> it'll, it'll much make more sense. I'm going to press on, I hope. Sorry. Because actually what I'm saying is that this is all bad and you shouldn't do it. I'm not going to talk about it again. So, Okay, there are three kinds of fitting. The kind that most people have heard about is what I call explicit fitting, and that's where you do have this black box. So you basically have some kind of tool that, um, you know, in, using some machine learning or just regression or simple um, grid search, just finds the best possible set of trading strategy and parameters. Um, and it, it's done automatically for you. So you put the data in and it tells you, okay, there's no human intervention in the process. The second kind of fitting is implicit fitting. So implicit fitting goes something like this. So you create a training strategy, and you may run an explicit fitting process on it to find the parameters, and then you look at the results. And you look at the results and you think, hmm, I can do a bit better than that. So then you go back and you make a change to the strategy, or you try a different strategy, or you try a different set of parameters, or you change the fitting method. Now, basically, what you've done is the, the kind of crime of fitting, which is that you've effectively done something you couldn't have done if you actually were trading this model in the past. You've used a time machine. You've used a time machine to go back to the beginning of the data set, do things a bit differently, and go forwards again. So you've kind of corrupted your model with the knowledge of what's already happened in the data. So you burn through your data once to fit the model, and then you burn through it again. Okay, so you're, you're basically going to be ending up in a situation where, at best, um, your backtest performance will be inflated, will look better than it really would have been, and at worst, your model will have become overfitted because you've made it too complicated. The third kind of fitting is what I call tacit fitting. And this basically is the problem that pretty much everyone has a rough idea of what trading strategies would have worked in the past and would have worked in the future, because they've you know, been to events like this, or they've read books, or you know, they've read an academic paper, um, you know, so for example, if you were to put me in a room with, with no access to data whatsoever and say creating a trading strategy, I could still do it. I could still create a trading strategy that will work pretty well over the last 40 years because I, I know kind of most things that work or, you know, already and arguably to have done that in the past would have required the time machine because that knowledge that's in my head I wouldn't have access to in the past. You know, you wouldn't have known in like 1950 that a particular training strategy would have worked really well for the next 60 years. You know that now, 
That's knowledge that's inside your head. So examples of tacit knowledge are theory, you know, stuff like um, behavioral finance theory is quite good for telling you why certain trading strategies work or arbitrage pricing theory for why certain risk factors seem to make money. Um, common sense, I mean, it's common sense that if you can construct something that buys at the bid and sells at the offer, you'll make money, for example. Previous research and what I call market folklore. So, you know, stuff like if you can read books by Jesse Livermore that are over 100 years old and he'll tell you stuff like, oh, don't fight the tape, which basically means that trend following works. You know? So we all know this stuff. So the idea behind this, this talk is to say, well, let's not do fitting or do the absolute minimum as possible. And what we're going to do instead is actually design our trading strategies. Because what's ironic is that a lot of people who work in this industry are actually from an engineering background. But what we do bears no resemblance to engineering whatsoever. I'm going to try and bring some of the engineering back into this. Um, I'm actually going to say tacit knowledge exists. And there's nothing we can do about it. It's, it's going to, always going to be there in our heads. Well, let's just acknowledge that and actually use that as a basis for building our training strategies. In this way, we can avoid implicit fitting, hopefully completely, because it really is the most insidious kind of fitting you can do. Um, and we'll do some explicit fitting, which is the safest kind of fitting you can do. We can do the minimum amount of it, and we'll do it in the right way. And the basic idea is that rather than starting with data, we're going to start with an idea. So to design a trading strategy, this is the process that you might want to follow. You start off with tacit knowledge, which is spelt incorrectly. This is, I think, the fourth time I've given this presentation, and the first time I've noticed that. Um, and Basically, the tacit knowledge will give you an idea, an idea like, for example, trend following works in a lot of different markets. Um, and then you design a trend following strategy. Um, and in that design process, you're going to use your tacit knowledge, but you're also going to use some fake data, which I'll talk about more in a second. And you're going to use some real data, but not as much as we used before. And that will produce the trading strategy, the algo, and the parameters. Um, so, this is kind of much more similar to how we build cars or any other kind of product, right? Because we use all of these additional sources of information, not just the real data, to build our cars with. Um, you know, we have theory, so aerodynamic theory, you know, about what shapes of cars are good. Um, there's market research. We can ask people, what kind of car do you like? Um, people have personal taste about what cars they prefer. We can build prototypes. We look at previous products we've built. We can go to focus groups. We do all of these things in the design process. We don't just look at some hard data. Um, and I'd argue it's better to design trading strategies in the same way. OK. Everyone happy with the premise of what we're going to talk about? Question at the back. Um, so, okay, so I think data mining, it used in its perjurative sense, is, is a bad thing, right? Um, I'm agnostic about particular methods that you might use for your data mining or your fitting, um, except to note that some, with some methods, it's harder to know whether you're overfitting or not. So I think, generally speaking, if you're fitting in a very simple way with, say, a grid search or a regression or something, it's kind of, if you know what you're doing, it's pretty obvious when you're overfitting and you can control it in fairly easy ways. Um, with machine learning, when it's used by people who don't really know what they're doing, which unfortunately is increasingly the case because it's become this big fashionable fad, okay, I'm biased, fine, I admit it. Um, it's increasingly the case that people are overfitting without realizing it. So it's not really a kind of, all oh, machine learning is bad, although, you know, I've admitted I don't like it very much. It's, more, it's that bad machine learning is bad, and it's easier to do bad things with machine learning than with other techniques. Is that kind of OK? Would you have a problem with a, a system that was spat out from a machine learning algorithm that didn't have any kind of theoretical logic to it? I wouldn't have a problem with it, but that's not really what this presentation is about. Okay. So maybe that's something we can park to later. Question at the front. Uh, 
Um, that might become clearer in a minute. Okay. OK, so just to sort of clarify the point about tacit knowledge. So here's an example of some tacit knowledge that you may or may not have about trend following. So this kind of market folklore. So you know, this is stuff you can read in books that's 100 years old. This is the famous example of, of course, the turtle traders, who are kind of legendary now. And there's sort of three kind of big um, traditions of, of CTAs, which are a type of firm that was very associated with trend following. So there's you know, firms in the US that have been doing this for a long time, firms in the UK and, and in mainland Europe. There's also been empirical research showing this phenomenon exists, or at least existed in the past, because, you know, at the end of the day, things can stop working in the future. That's just the world we live in. Um, and then this theory trying to explain why this seems to work, because, you know, in a perfectly kind of homo economicus model, these things shouldn't work. So um, there's, you know, a lot of stuff around behavioral finance I kind of quite like. So the idea of um, it being explained by different risk preferences in a model called prospect theory, or by people herding around positive announcements and jumping in after they've come out. Um, and there is also some possibility that the behavior of funds like risk parity funds, which are an increasingly part of the investment world at the moment, actually creates these trends. Anyway, so these are examples of tacit knowledge. Okay, so we believe, we believe that trend following exists and we want to design a strategy around it. So let me make clear again the difference in, in kind of um, the way that things are being done here. We're not going to look at a bunch of data and say, oh, let's find a trading strategy that works and one that, the one that comes out happens to be a trend following model. We actually say, well, you know, we know trend following works already. So let's just design a trend following strategy. Um, we already know if my tacit knowledge it works. We're not going to achieve anything by fitting it within the data, except potentially making our model too complex and overfitted. So, sorry. So, the theory that you mentioned there, a number of them are actually empirical different theories, like the confirmation bias or the prospect theory. They aren't really the phenomenon, the silly maximization to begin with, but they actually observations and people's actions regularities that actually still back work. So that's, that's kind of true, except, I mean, this isn't really the time and the place to have this conversation, but very quickly, um, I think there is kind of like biological evidence about how our minds work that kind of supports now more and more these sort of empirical theories that started with empirical observations, if you like. So, you know. Anyway, uh, I don't have an argument whether trend following works or doesn't work. It's just a kind of hook to hang the point of the presentation on, because we'll be here all day if we're going to have that argument, right? OK, so having decided we're going to build the trend following rule for reasons that I'm not going to justify any longer, um, we've still got a bunch of unanswered questions, OK? And the, so, you know, how long do trends last for? When should we enter them? When should we exit them? Should we have a stop loss rule? What should it be? How do we identify markets that are or not trend friendly? How do I identify how strong the trend is? What size should our positions be? And I can kind of sum all of these up into these two basic questions. What's the algorithm? You know, what's the recipe for cooking the chicken? And what are its parameters? So the data first approach, of course, would be to answer all these questions by, you know, starting with the data, starting with a whole set of possible algorithms, a whole set of possible parameters, putting them in the magic fitting box, and we, the answer that comes out is the best. And the definition of best is extremely narrow, OK? So we normally define best as the best return versus risk in a given data set. If we assume that leverage is possible and risk is Gaussian, then your utility preferences become irrelevant, and you just need to find the highest Sharpe ratio. Um, other measures of performance are available. Um, but the key point I'm making here is that we're using a single metric of what best is, and we're basing it on a single source of data, which is the past. Now, if we're going to design a strategy, we need to take a different approach. First of all, we need to widen things beyond a single metric, sharp ratio, historic performance. We're going to look at performance, yes, because it is important, because no one wants to be poor. But we're also going to look at turnover, the way something behaves in given scenarios, a whole bunch of extra stuff. And we're going to use more sources of information. So we're not just going to use data. We are going to use common sense. We are going to use theoretical principles. We are going to use fake data. And we are going to use a little bit of real data. OK, so this is kind of the meat of the presentation now. So we're going to follow six steps to build a trading strategy. OK, the first step is you need to start with a framework, which imposes some conditions. 
That sounds very fancy, but basically the idea behind a framework is that you don't start with a completely clean sheet of paper when you come to designing a trading strategy. If you, you have a framework, it's, it's, it's kind of a thing you can slot in a whole bunch of trading strategies and trading rules that may be quite different, a whole bunch of different instruments you want to trade. Um, and you only then have to calibrate the stuff relating to that, okay? You're not going to calibrate a whole lot of other stuff. And there are different ways of doing it, but this is the way I do it, what it's worth. So basically, we start off with some trading rules um, and some instruments we're going to trade. Each of those trading rules produces forecasts. We'll talk a lot about what a forecast is in a minute. Um, we combine this together, so we end up with a single forecast for each trading rule. Um, and then we, rule, we work out what our risk target needs to be. We work out how many positions need to be given our forecast and our risk targeting. And then we, we put the whole thing into a portfolio. So we need to kind of allocate capital to each of these things. Don't worry too much about the details. If you really care that much, you can buy my book, you know, whatever. Um, but the key point is that the, the framework imposes a lot of conditions on what the thing at the top, the trading rules, should look like, okay? So if you want to go back to the car analogy, basically what car makers tend to do is have platforms. Um, so if you buy a car from Volkswagen, you may think it's very special, but actually it's, there's probably like 50 cars, many of which haven't got a Volkswagen badge on it, that have got exactly the same bit inside it, and it's just the bodywork and the engine that's different. That's kind of what we're doing here. So you don't need to design the whole car from scratch, because that would cost you billions of dollars. Uh, I mean, that's what Tesla did, right? And they're not making any money. Um, you start with a platform that makes life easier. OK, there are too many words on this slide. I will go through them as fast as I can. So what is, a, what is a trading rule? A trading rule is something that makes forecasts of risk-adjusted price changes. Forecasts are continuous, not discrete entry and exit conditions. So it doesn't say buy or sell. It says, I'm currently neutral on the euro dollar, or I'm a bit confident and bullish on the euro dollar, or I'm very bullish on the euro dollar, okay? It's a number that's scaled. Um, forecasts are scaled in an instrument and temporal independent way. So basically what that means is that a forecast of five has the same meaning no matter what you're trading and when you're trading, okay? There are no magic numbers. Um, the forecast is proportional to uh, the expected Sharpe ratio, which is the mean over the standard deviation. Um, your position will therefore be proportional to that divided by the standard deviation. Uh, that's just Kelly or Markovitz. Um, the, you need to come up with, with one magic number, which is kind of a common scale for all the forecasts. I choose 10. It doesn't matter what you choose as long as you have a number. Um, in principle, we'll use all forecasts on all markets. Very much later in the presentation, we'll kind of relax that and say, well, actually, we will look at real data to see if that's justified. Um, we're trend following. Um, trends do happen in different time frames. So to deal with this, we're going to use multiple variations of the same trading rule. So what I mean by variations is essentially you have one trading rule that's going to do trend following. And the, the, vari the variations will be different parameters that go into that. Um, costs are really important, really, really important. Most people underestimate how important costs are because costs are very, very predictable, but pre-cost returns are not. They're extremely random. So you need to spend a lot of time thinking about costs. A lot of this presentation will focus a lot on costs, not on returns. Uh, and the nice thing about designing things with this approach is you can control your costs very, very easily. And then you kind of take it to real data just to check that it vaguely works, which you know it does anyway, because you've started with an idea you already know works. Um, so we want to throw away systems that trade too quickly that are too expensive. We also want to throw away systems that trade really slowly, because at some point, basically, you just become a buy and hold investor. And no one wants to do that, because, you know, People will, you know, people go out to your parties and say, well, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a, I'm a trader. Oh, that's how exciting. I'm a buy and hold investor. Not so exciting unless you're Warren Buffett, in which case I guess people would still listen to you. Okay. So, so earlier I said there were a whole bunch of things we needed to consider when designing a, a trend following rule, blah, 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 blah. The good thing about building this framework is we can do this. Nearly all of those things become irrelevant because the framework deals with them for us. It deals with the position sizing, it deals with the stop loss rule, and so on and so forth. All we need to do is identify how strong a trend currently is. 
So that makes our life already a lot easier because instead of fitting, you know, do, you know, you can imagine that to fit a model that had dozens of parameters to account for all of these things, you know, you're probably almost certainly overfitting, but we're going to narrow the number of parameters we have to fit down to a very small number already. Okay. Okay, so trends, what are trends? Well, trends are essentially when a wiggly line on a graph goes down or up. Okay, so this is, uh, if you can't read, 2008, when I was still working for a hedge fund, so quite an exciting period to be in a hedge fund, as you can probably imagine. Um, this is the S&P 500, and you can see that for the whole of 2008, I would argue there wasn't really much of a trend. And then in, uh, sorry, 2007, and then in 2008, there was a very strong downward trend, and we all know why that happened. Now, computers can't just look at, you can't just say to a computer, please look at this graph and tell me whether you see a pattern or not. You need to actually tell it, you know, give it a way of identifying a trend. Um, so, and there are many ways of doing this. When I first put this presentation together, I chose to do it with a method that I hadn't personally ever used before, um, purely so that I wouldn't have like so much tacit knowledge. So for example, if I'd used, I don't know, exponentially weighted moving average crossovers, which was the subject of a presentation before lunch, I know so much about those, I'd be, you know, I, I, there'd be all this tacit knowledge in my head already. I'd be making design decisions and, and not knowing whether I was making them because I already knew that something worked or for other reasons. So I used something I never used before, which is a very simple, uh, to just do a regression basically. Okay, so if you don't know what a regression is, it's just a kind of way of drawing a line through a bunch of points. And when you do a regression, uh, you get um, two numbers, um, and the one we care about is beta, which essentially is the slope of the line. So if beta is bigger than zero, the current price is in an uptrend, and if it's less than zero, it's in a downtrend. So just to say as well, this is not an original idea. Many people have come up with this idea before. Um, so the only unanswered question we have is, how far back do we look? How many points do we do in our regression? Are we looking for like one week trends, or six month trends, or whatever? So basically, we need one parameter, which is I'm going to originally call n. And n is the, the number of weekdays um, that we're going to look over because I'm using daily data. So the single parameter we need is, is a window size. Everybody OK? Is that a question, or are you scratching your head? It is a question. Please speak up. There wasn't a question. No questions. Right, let's move on. OK. Good. Right. As predicted, everyone's falling asleep. OK. So we're now going to um, basically use, um, we're going to just look at one kind of event that happened. And we're going to use common sense to actually design our algorithm. OK. So the one event we're going to do, we're going to look at 2008. We're going to say, well, if we actually ran this regression, what would the beta come out at? it would come out at minus 564.1. And what does that mean? Well, the y-axis is in, is in S&P 500 index points. So this is telling you basically the, the current rate of fall of the S&P 500, just over 500 points a year. Um, now, these are the conditions that we came up with earlier for the trading strategy. And there's a whole bunch at the top that relate to how forecasts are scaled. So does this thing scale well? OK, remember, forecast should mean the same thing for different instruments for different time periods. So I run this regression now on, say, a euro dollars. The answer would probably come out as minus 0 0.02. And here it comes out minus 564. You can't compare those two numbers directly because they relate to two completely different time periods, two completely different instruments. And that's just common sense. We don't need to do any fitting to do this, OK? We're designing this thing, not fitting it, yeah? We're just thinking about what we're doing. People in this industry spend way too much time just pressing a button to let a computer do the work and not thinking for themselves. Rant over. OK, so I said earlier that we define forecasts in a particular way. We define them to be proportional to the, the, the expected return divided by the standard deviation. So basically, beta, what units is the beta in? Well, it's in units of a change in price. Yeah, it's in price units. So it's quite simple. If we divide that by um, a standard deviation of price changes, we've now got a scaleless quantity. Or in English, we've, we've kind of factored it 
in such, constructed this thing in such a way that we can now compare the forecasts for different instruments for different time periods. Yeah. No need to look at any data. This is just common sense or theory, depending on how you want to think about it. OK, so now we're going to have another go at developing the algorithm. So we're now going to take a little bit more data. Now, I am showing you plots of real data, but I'm not looking at, for example, the performance of the algorithm here. OK, so I'm not doing any fitting. OK, I'm just looking at this thing to see if it behaves in the way I expect. I still not have an assessment whether it's making or losing money. I'm deliberately not doing that. That's going to be the very last thing I do, OK? So I've got the whole history now of the S&P 500, um, at least the history I've got for my data set. Um, and I'm looking for something that's got a kind of a good scale. So I'm looking for something that doesn't, isn't like really small in one period and large in another. And I would say, overall, that looks pretty good from a scale perspective. And I'm also looking for it to kind of behave the way I expect. So. This thing is long, the lines above zero in the, the bull market between you know, the internet crash and the, the GFC. That's what I'd expect. It goes short in the GFC, that's what I'd expect. It's long you know, for the big bull run that happened ever since, apart from a bit of a blip in 016. So it's behaving the way I'd expect a trend following rule to behave. But there is one thing with this plot I do not like. Can anyone guess what it is? Sorry? No, that's just the x-axis. I'll give you a clue. God, I wish I had a laser pointer. Yeah, there's that weird blip at the start. And what's causing that is because um, if we do a regression with a small number of data points, we can get very extreme results. And that's exactly what's happening here. Um, and that's just common sense. Um, I could if you've experienced in designing trading strategies, you would have thought about that already. But for the purpose of this presentation, I didn't. So what you need to do is, is set um, the, the, the regression so that it doesn't start doing any regression until it's got a certain number of periods, uh, data points. And I just set this to the window size divided by four. So if we're looking at uh, a year, which is 256, uh, divide that by four, we need at least, well, three months of data before we actually do the regression. And that would get rid of that ugly bit at the start. Again, we, looked at, we haven't looked at performance. Okay? We have looked at real data, but only to give us an indication of how the thing behaves. OK, fake data. So until um, Donald J. Trump came on the scene, I used to call this real data, but I think fake data is more evocative of the current political climate. So, so what is fake data? Um, and why, how are we going to use it? So we're going to use the fake data to check, first of all, that this thing really does capture trends, which we've sort of done in a kind of eyeball-y sort of way with one data set, but we're going to do it in a more rigorous way now with fake data. And the other thing we're going to do is, is, is look at costs, because costs are really important. And one of the, like I said, one of the big advantages of this approach is you can design trading strategies whose costs are good, you know, low enough um, that they would actually be profitable um, without having to do any fitting. OK, so to be very specific, what we're going to do, first we're going to get an understanding of how trend length relates to profitability and window size. In other words, we're going to ask ourselves the question, if I, want to, if I think tra trends in markets last for a week, what kind of window size should I run? If I think trends last for three months, what kind of window size could I run? And you could think of a way this could be done with real data, but we're going to stay away from real data we're not fitting, we're designing. Um, we're going to get an idea of how fast a different window size trades. So, for example, is it practical to use a two-day window size? Is it practical to use a six-month window size? You know, it's hard to tell without looking at something. We don't want to look at real data. We're going to do it with fake data. We're then going to make some decisions. So the first thing we're going to do is get rid of any window sizes that are too expensive to trade. So that's going to be small window sizes, because the smaller the window size, the more this thing is going to trade and change position. Yeah. Um, we're also going to get rid of any window sizes that are too slow, because we'll end up as long-term buy and hold investors, and people won't talk to us at parties. Um, and then we're going to do something a little bit more complicated, which was we're going to look at the correlation between different window sizes to work out what would be a good set of window sizes to choose in our final trading strategy design. So that's the other thing to say. We're not going to choose um, like one of these things, one single best strategy. We're going to use a number of, choose a number of different variations 
to capture trends over different time periods. Yeah, so we want to end up with you know, one trading rule that we've already designed. Now we're looking at the parameters of the trading rule, and we're going to have several sets of parameters that we want. Everybody happy? Wrong question to ask. Is this making sense? Your happiness or otherwise is of no consequence. OK. Fake data. So basically, very simple. What we do is we start with um, a sawtooth pattern. Um, and then we're going to add some Gaussian noise to it. And you end up with something that I would argue looks quite convincingly like a real price series. Now, you could do something fancy to make this a bit more realistic. You could use a more complicated statistical process here, for example. But, you know, um, for this application, it doesn't make any difference. Um, if you were doing something like um, a strategy with, say, option pricing, this is way too simplistic. But for what we're doing here, it's good. It works for a trend-following strategy. Similarly, you could design it to work with the opposite kind of strategy, which is a mean reversion strategy. In other words, something that tries to buy and sell at the, the troughs and the peaks. Yeah? OK. So this graph, this page has way too many numbers on it. Let me try and explain it. So each row is a different window size. OK, so at the top, we've got five-day window, which is a week of business days. And at the bottom, Better. At the bottom, sorry to the sponsors for moving your banner. Um, at the bottom, we've got 256 business days, which is 12 months. Okay. Um, and then basically, each column is the results of generating some fake data with trends of a given length. So the first column is a 21 day trend. So that's trends that last for a month. So the sawtooth goes up for a month, then reverses and goes down for a month, then up for a month, and so on. Each of the numbers is the sharp ratio of testing a given um, n on a given set of fake data with certain trends. Actually, these sharp ratios are averages, because obviously this is fake data. There's a random stochastic element to it. So I'll get slightly different results depending on what the randomness comes out at. So in practice, I do this thing tens of thousands of times and take an average. Um, so high numbers here are good. Low numbers are bad. Negative numbers are really bad. So let's highlight some, some things of interest. So in bold, I've put the numbers that are the maximum. So in other words, these are the values of n that seem to be the best for a given trend length. So for example, if we look at trends of um, 128 days, which is about six months, it looks like we need to have um, a, um, an n value of between 21 and 64 days. So we need to have, you know, we need to be using a window size of between one and three months. So very, very approximately and roughly, you, need, you should have a, um, it looks like to capture a trend of a given length, you need to have a window size of about a quarter or a third of that, very roughly. Um, so shorter trend lengths um, are not as good, because basically they're not seeing the big picture, right? They're not seeing a big long trend, they're just trying to pick up on lots of little noise. And they're trading lots and missing, all, they're missing the big trend. Um, if you trade slower than the, the, the right end, so for example, for the column one to eight, if you get down to four months and five months and then six months, you start to lose money. And what's happening there is that you're looking over a longer series of time and you're actually missing the actual trend itself. So instead of seeing an up and a down, you're just seeing a straight line. Okay? Um, and there's a very interesting phenomenon where if the trend length and the window size are mismatched, you end up with really shocking performance, like there's a sharp there of minus five. Um, and what's basically happening here is you've created a strategy that's selling here and buying here. It's exactly out of sync with the trends, yeah. And uh, AHL, where I used to work, and there's at least one other person here who used to work, we used to call this the harmonic frequency of death, which is nice. OK, so this is really interesting because actually this gives you a lot of um, kind of intuition about how trend following rules work and how this rule works specifically without going anywhere near any real data. Um, and if, for example, you had strong opinions about the sorts of trends you wanted to capture, you could actually just take these numbers straight away and build your trading strategy. We're not going to do that, but you could do that. OK, now let's think about costs. 
So what we're going to do is measure how quickly these things trade. That's step one. And then step two is to, to take costs of real things that we actually trade um, and then multiply that by the number of trades per year, essentially, um, and can see whether that comes out at a number that's excessive or not. Unsurprisingly, short, trend, uh, short windows, small values of N, have higher turnover. So for example, an N of 5 has a turnover every year of about 176. And they, they sort of tails off, I guess, pretty much exponentially until six, seven, or eight months um, when you're down to turnovers of, you know, six or seven. Okay. So, how does this translate to real, real costs? So, two columns here. The first column is for a cheap future, the S&P 500. The second column is for an expensive future, which is the euro dollar future. One reason I chose these is their costs are actually different by a factor of 10 exactly, at least on my estimates, which is why the second column is 10 times a second, the first, which is quite nice. So um, these numbers are in risk-adjusted return units, they're in sharp, return, sharp ratio units. So for example, if you have a sharp of 0.5 and you were trading the S&P 500 and you were trading it with an N of 21, the number there is 0.036, so your after cost sharp would be 0.5 minus 0.036, which is 0.454, no, 64, whatever. I'm not very good with maths. That's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> not very good with, you know, arithmetic. Okay, so um, in practice, for reasons that are too boring to explain now. I allow a maximum of 13 basis points of costs a year when I'm trading, preferably a lot less. So everything in bold is fine because it's less than 13 basis points, which is 0.13. So we can trade euro dollar, for example, with everything apart from N of 5. Sorry, we can trade S&P 500, which is cheap, with everything except N of 5. Um, euro dollar is quite expensive. We need, you know, N of 85 or greater, okay? So at this point, we can throw away N of 5, because we know even with the cheapest future that we can trade, it's still too expensive. So just throw it away. OK, correlation structure. Um, so basically, we do, what we want to do is avoid trading all of these guys, like N 10, 15, 21, 42, blah, 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 or even N 17 or N 86, because most of these things are going to give you incredibly similar results, yeah? Or in, in you know, in quantitative terms, they can have very high correlations. Um, so I basically said, well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to throw away anything that's got a correlation of greater than 0.9, because it can, be, it can bring me real, very little benefit to my portfolio to have, have it in there. It turns out that um, if you have a window size of, say, 10, if you then multiply that by the square root of 2, so 10 times the square root of 2 is 14 and a bit, I managed to do that one successfully, if you do that, then as a general rule, the correlation comes out at about 0.9. But if you compare ones that are further apart, the correlation comes out at less than 0.9. And you can actually prove this if you're good enough at stochastic calculus. Um, anyway, the point is that using fake data, we can actually prune our set of possible parameters further to include only ones that are diversifying. Yeah? So we've thrown away the expensive one, and now we're throwing away the ones that are just all the same. Yeah, so we're going to end up with a, a smaller number of parameters that we have to look at. So to summarize, um, we want window sizes in root two steps. We're not going to bother with anything less than 10 because it's too expensive even for S&P 500 futures, which are dirt cheap to trade. Um, and anything bigger than 200 is buy and hold, forget that. So we end up with the following set, 10, 14, 20, 28, 40, 57, blah, blah, blah. And you can confirm to yourself that each of this, these are each root two steps with obviously rounding. And we know from uh, this page that that will capture trends from about, lasting from about, you know, a month up to about 18 months. So it's a pretty wide spectrum of the trend following universe that we're capturing here. Questions? Everyone's like writing down their questions for later, I'm sure. Right, okay. Right. 
We're now going to use some real data, but we're still not going to look at performance. So we're not, we're not in any danger of getting to overfitting hell. And we're going to do this basically for two reasons. Firstly, um, to check the kind of sensitivity of our parameters. So in the fake data, we got very similar results from you know, N of 20 and N of 25. But in real data, maybe we're going to miss, we, maybe we've missed something. Maybe our fake data is too unrealistic and too fake. Um, and isn't capturing some important st market structure. Um, maybe the parameters are really sensitive to when you bring real data to them. Checking parameter sensitivity is a thing that people do with real data anyway. It's probably worth doing it here. Um, and the other thing we're going to do is just check that we haven't done something really stupid, because it can happen, you know. Um, and also, plenty of people think of ideas that seem great on paper, but when you actually bring them to real data are shockingly bad. I've done it myself many times. OK, so what we're going to do first is check the scaling. So remember I, I said earlier that if you divide this thing by the standard deviation of returns in the design process, that was a really good way of um, ensuring these things had consistent scale so that a particular number meant the same thing across time and across different instruments. So um, we kind of did that with theory. We didn't even look at fake data. We just sort of asserted it was true. Let's check it's true. So each row here is a different futures contract. Um, across the, col the columns across the top are our chosen window sizes that are left over after all the pruning we've done. Um, now, there is no reason why the, the number here, the number here essentially is the, um, it's like the, the, the kind of standard deviation of the forecast for that instrument. For what it, you know, it's how much. There's no reason why these numbers should be the same, like across the rows. There's no reason why the window size, the the, num, the scaling factor for window size of 10 should be the same as the scaling factor of 160. In fact, again, if you if you know about stochastic calculus, you can actually prove why that shouldn't be so. But what we do want to see is consistent scaling in columns. Yeah, we want to see for a given set of parameters, a given trading rule variation, that you know, the, the, the scaling factor comes out as about the same for 10-year bonds as for S&P 500. So we want these numbers in columns to look similar. And they are similar enough, given that there is a, a degree of randomness in how you measure these things, um, that I'm kind of happy at this point. We, we ought to do the same thing across time as well and check the time scaling is correct. We're not going to bother. Okay. Now, these are, the these are the figures we've already seen. This is the turnover of each value of n with fake data. And this is it with real data. Uh, it would have been very helpful if I'd made these the same size so that when I did this, the numbers would just change. But, so if we focus on n of 10, which is one of the ones we're using, with fake data, we've got a turnover of 75 times a year. With real data, we get 80. Uh, 160, which actually isn't in this thing, but would be between 7.4 and 7.1, we get 7. So the turnover with real data is similar enough to fake data that, again, I'm happy that I haven't done anything crazy. So what's worked with fake data? What I've, the, what I've worked, designed this thing to work with fake data, and it works pretty well with real data too. Okay. Costs. Actually, this step is, you know, a little bit pointless because costs cost is just turnover times something and the something's the same, but let's do it anyway. So if we take, um, I don't know, um, let's take euro dollar with um, an N of um, about 60. The costs there are 0.13 with fake data. Um, with real data, it's 0.11. It's pretty close. Again, the ones in bold are the ones that are cheap enough to trade for a given instrument. Um, same thing with S&P 500, with a window size of 10. Fake data, we had costs of 0.075. Now we've got costs of 0.1. It's similar enough. We're not doing anything crazy. And I've included the costs for some of the contracts there just for variety. Um, and the other thing we did remember was look at the correlation. I said that they were, the correlations were about 0.9 between the ones we've chosen. And they've come out a bit lower here at 0.85. And I actually think that... This is an artifact of the fake data itself, the fact that it's a bit lower. Because, because the fake data, the way it's constructed, I think the correlations are probably artificially higher compared to real data. But it's still not a million miles away, so I'm pretty happy with the design decisions I've made. 
So to recap, we've used fake data, we've used theory, we've not looked at any real data except as a sense check, we've not looked at performance, we've done no fitting, we've just been designing, we've just been building our cars. Um, now we need to put our cars on the racetrack. Any questions? Yes? Um, so the framework takes care of that. The question was, how do you enter or exit a position? The framework takes care of that because basically it gives you a continuous forecast every day. When that forecast is positive, you will be long. If that forecast then goes from positive to negative, at that point you will actually close your position and go short, and so on and so forth. And then uh, also, do we need to detect the regime or whether the trend exists uh, for that period of time, or do we assume it already exists? So we, so basically the way it deals with that is, in periods when trends are weak, the forecasts will be much smaller in number. And because we will then take smaller positions at those times, we'll probably end up losing a bit of money. But basically we wait for the big trends to arrive. Um, so again, the framework handles that essentially. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Questions about whether I take log prices. I do not take log prices. Um, log prices would, um, I do actually have another trading rule that, that, sort, that basically um, does some volatility normalization of the price curve, which maybe we can talk about later. Um, it, the short answer is log, using log prices would make almost no difference in this application. It, it, if a market was going up a lot over time, it would probably reduce some of the long bias that you'd have from that. But you arguably want that anyway, so. Any more questions? At the back. So I've, I've fitted the window size, but I've never looked at the performance of different window sizes for real data. So I've not, I, I would use the word calibration rather than fitting. So a, um, a metaphor might be in the car, car industry, I've designed a car that I know should be fast, given what I know about physics, given cars I've already built, except no given all this kind of stuff, but I haven't actually put it on a racetrack yet against other cars. Because that, that's then fitting, and that's not what I, I want to avoid doing that. There was a quick third row back. What considerations did you take um, when you were actually building that? Were you looking at, you know, from a, from a trend point of view, it, it made sense or, you know? So all, all I was saying was, I want a price series that has regular trends in it of a certain length. What's the simplest way of doing that? Um, that is, I believe, is the simplest way of doing that. You need to add the random noise or um, it screws up other things because of volatility scaling and stuff like that. Um, but ba basically, yeah, I mean, I, you can make things more complicated and, and say, oh, actually, in real life, for example, in the stock market, things tend to go, you know, the old saying, up the stairs and down the escalator, right? They go up fast and down, sorry, up slowly and down fast. So you could build that kind of behavior into it if you wanted. The more you go down that route, the more danger is that you're actually essentially importing some real data into the back door, because you'll create a system which knows that happens, I'll come to you, um, and then, and then um, you know, basically f f fits to that, and we're gonna try and avoid doing that. Yes, this is the last question, because I've got a bit more to do, and then the other questions can wait. Just one of the um, So what you're saying is, where the slope of that regression is very steep, yeah. um, you have a large position. Yeah, there. yeah. Where there's flat, you have zero, yeah. and so on, it's it out. Yeah. Really yes, way. yeah. Although, in principle, you could run this at a faster time scale. But given that N of five is too expensive to trade, running it at a faster time frequency wouldn't make any sense. I'm gonna move on to the last section, and then if, there might be a couple of questions at the end, and then otherwise you can just come back later. Okay, so we're gonna use some real data. We're gonna use performance calculators using real data, okay? Remember earlier I said in principle all forecasts will be used on all markets, and the portfolio optimization stage will happen later. We are now at later. So basically, 
the way the framework works is that we take a weighted average of the forecasts from the different traded rule variations. Um, the forecasts are all in the same scale, so we, the weights can just be sensible. What are weights, the weights depend on? Okay, well, we want to upweight things that do better, in, in theory at least. Um, we want to downweight things that are too expensive, so you're, for um, a market that's expensive to trade, we'd probably want to have less weight on the faster ends and more on the slower ones. And also the correlation structure is important because um, ends that are a long way apart give more diversification benefit. So this is a well-known portfolio optimization problem um, that people have been looking at for at least 60 years. It has well-known problems um, and some well-known solutions. Um, part of me wishes we didn't have to do this because then, then it would, this presentation would be great. I could tell you that you could become quant traders without ever using any real data. Using real data costs money. It's time consuming. Much better to just sit with a pencil of paper and design a trading strategy. Unfortunately, there is the danger that you will design something that doesn't actually make money in real life. Um, so this is the only line of defense we have against doing that. Because um, basically, if you then do this process and it turns out that you've come up with a, a trading rule or a variation of a trading rule that, doesn't, that loses money, and also if you're doing this properly, it has to lose money in a statistically significant way, then you'll give it a lower allocation and maybe even, even a zero allocation. Um, so this is the, we're doing explicit, going back to my earlier discussion, this is explicit fitting. The nice thing about explicit fitting is you, you can control it so that you don't end up overfitting. And that's exactly what we intend to do. OK. Um, the first time I did this presentation, someone put my hand up and said, you are very inconsistent, sir. Um, I would say, actually, arguably, I'm being a bit hypocritical, right? Because I'm saying that you should not fit the parameters of the model, but it's OK to fit these, these risk allocations. Why, why are these things different? You know, why is one OK and why is one bad? Um, it's like the difference in, um, in Roman Catholicism between um, the, there's two kinds of sins. There's a venal sin and there's the other one. Um, what's the difference? They both seem like bad things. Um, okay, well, one answer, to, I, one thing I will say is that the number of parameters is much smaller. Okay, so rather than having potentially a huge sea of potential trading rules with different parameters, um, you know, you've only got can have, you're going to fit basically n minus one parameters where n is the number of trading variations you have. Um, when you're fitting properly, you need to do it on a rolling out sample basis. It's feasible to do this here, whereas it's not feasible with a lot of kind of neural network techniques because the, the amount of time they take to do just one fit is just so large. You can't do that properly. Uh, at best, you, you get two data sets and you split them in and cross-validate them. Um, you can't do multiple fits every year, which is what I prefer to do. Um, from a more technical point of view, the actual optimization surface is quite nice. And like I said, there are well-developed techniques to, to cope with the problems of this. This is a very well-studied problem. Um, I think it's much harder to do implicit fitting of portfolio weights than it is when you're actually calibrating the trading rule directly. Anyway, if, you don't, if you still think I'm a hypocrite, fine. Shoot me. Okay, so this is the only time I'm going to show you real performance. So because otherwise it would, you know be about unfair. So basically, to, to actually fit the risk allocation, what we do is we, we generate the performance of each of these things. Um, and you can see there's a couple that don't do very well. The reason that they're flat to begin with and then they don't do very well is that these are only allocated to by the very cheapest markets because these are the fastest values of N. And they're only traded by like S&P 500 and something else. And that data doesn't start till later. That's why they start only halfway through. And you can see they, they don't do that well. So this brings me back to what I said earlier about why implicit fitting is so dangerous because what a lot of people would do is straight away, you know, run this, get these account curves and immediately go, oh well, oh hang on a second, I don't like the look of the pink and the orange line, I'll just get rid of those and rerun it and it'll be much better. Bam, that's implicit fitting. Okay, you shouldn't do that. Um, we're not going to do that. What we're actually going to do is, is out of samples. In other words, it's going to roll through, look only at historic data. It's going to see the performance of these things. And as their performance gets worse, it'll allocate less to them. 
but it'll do so in a statistically rigorous manner. It's not just being done on a pure time machine basis, if you like. And that's what happens if you trade this thing for 30, 40 years, whatever. So, summary. There are three kinds of ways of overfitting. Tacit, which is just stuff you know. Implicit, where you, you basically run stuff on the computer and then go back and change it. And explicit, where the computer does the fitting for you. Um, there are techniques to get around two of, those two of those things, but tacit knowledge you can't get rid of. So let's use that tacit knowledge and use it to design our training strategies rather than fitting them. The design process is you need to have a framework because that reduces the number of things you actually need to think about. Come up with um, the idea from whatever source you like. Um, then use some brand and data, or as we did here, a single scenario, real data, plus theory and common sense to develop your idea and get rid of the, the kind of bugs in it, like, or well, the scaling's not right, or we need a certain minimum window size. Then use fake data to fit or rather calibrate the algorithm, so for things like turnover, costs, performance in different scenarios, to, as you'd expect, so does it do well when trends are the right length for it? Um, what are the correlations like? Then bring in some real data just to check that the, those parameters make sense. And finally, do one explicit fit, which is to allocate, do a risk allocation and do it properly. So, advertising. More legal stuff, advertising. A um, couple of minutes for questions. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Um, could you go back to your chart where you had about 10 or 12 lines? Um, what I'm interested in, is that across all futures markets for one particular window size? Is each line a number of different futures markets at a certain window size? Or what does each line actually represent? Yeah, so it's an equal... Um, are they equal weighted? Yes. Yes and yes. So, just about to say, um, it's just an equally weighted um, across all the futures that are available to trade at that particular time. Um, if you do it with um, the actual portfolio weights you might use in reality, which could be slightly different, you'll get very similar results. At the back. So, so there are, they are the, basically, the, we, we, the, for this presentation, I had this wonderful situation where I fitted it with real, I calibrated it with fake data, and then checked the calibration of real data, and it was all hunky dory. The question is, what do you do if it isn't hunky dory, yeah? Well, or later? Define, define bad. What, what stage is bad, and, where, and how do you define bad? So like here, for example, here, yeah. uh, these numbers aren't consistent in columns. Yeah. OK, um, so there are there's two possibilities, I guess. One is that your trading strategy is badly designed. Um, that, doesn't mean it won't, that doesn't mean it won't make money or lose money. It just means it's badly designed, OK? It's a clear, clear difference that I'm trying to push here. Um, the second is that your fake data is, is too unrealistic. There are some features of the real market that you haven't captured. Um, so, in theory, you, you, you'd need to go back and understand what's going on. I mean, what I'd probably do in practice is pick a, a single one of these markets and ends and just graph it, which, you know, you could argue is a little bit, oh, you're bringing in some more real data, but we're not going to look at performance, we're just going to graph it and try and work out what's going wrong. So it might be, for example, that, so I've normalized the standard deviation, but this could be, say, the VIX, okay? The VIX is a market where the volatility is extremely unstable, right? So the, the estimated standard deviation jumps around all over the place and isn't necessarily a good forecast of what's gonna happen next. Um, 
So it might be the, 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 that that's, you know, it's one instrument that's causing me problems. I could just say, well, that's just that instrument. I'm not bothered about it. I could go back and change my framework, actually. That, that might be the right response in that situation to include something in my framework which generally deals better with instruments that don't have kind of Gaussian risk, essentially. Um, I could change my fake data, or I could go back and change my idea. But I'm... Um, there's a different, we're not overfitting here because what we're not saying is, oh, this idea doesn't work, it loses money. What we're saying is this thing does not behave in the way that, the, the, that it should do, okay? It's not, not doing what I expected to do. Instead of buying into trends, it's selling into them. Instead of the position scaling being consistent, it's inconsistent. So, um, you know, I wouldn't, I don't think that by going back and then fixing that problem, you're, you're necessarily getting into the realm of overfitting per se. But yes, perhaps you are using perhaps slightly more real data than you would otherwise. Is that a fair answer? We can go into it more later anyway. One more question, because we started late. Ricardo, how can I refuse you a question? Uh, I'm fascinated by the fake data. The yep. standard deviation that you use to be able to fake data. For example, how do you show So, for example, are you trying to see, you look at corn, you find the, the parameters of corn, and then you use those parameters to create a fake corn, and you do that for every single market? So, so you know when you do a presentation, and there's one question you hope nobody asks you. Um, okay, so it, what actually matters is the ratio of the amplitude of the trend, the standard deviation, okay? So it's scaleless in a sense, in that um, the, the, the position framework deal, deals with things in such a way that that's the only thing that matters. So you can think about that as kind of another measure of, tre of trend, a measure of trend strength, if you like. So if your standard deviation is really small and your amplitude of your trends is really big, you'll end up much closer to that thing on, in the top left-hand corner, yeah? If, on the other hand, your standard deviation is massive and your amplitude of your trends is really small, you end up with something that looks pretty much like a random walk. Um, now, if you then run this exercise on those things with a different amount of trend strength, these numbers change. So where, the standard, where, where there's a lot less volatility and more trend, the numbers get bigger, you make more money. Um, where there's a lot of noise and not much trend, you, lo you lose more money. However, the relative picture stays the same. So on a relative basis, these results are indifferent to like, the strength of the trend, if you like. Um, I actually did this with different ratios of standard deviation trend length, trend amplitude because yeah clearly it's a factor um, what I found was I got essentially different results but then the same findings at the end so to to avoid having to show you like a hundred slides full of numbers like this I just showed you one example where I've used one particular ratio um, but yeah it's a, it's a fair question I said one more question go on then Yeah, exactly. I mean, the point, the point of the fake data is to say, if there's a trend, a strong trend, I should get a strong signal from it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So if I got radically different results with more noise or less noise, then I'd be concerned, yeah, potentially. Right, I'm going to stop there, and there's a session later where you can ask me more questions. So thank you very much.